Well, thank you very much, you guys, for taking the time. I know it's very busy with you curling today and then with all the pictures and all the everything that's going on. So thank you for taking a few minutes. Um, how long have you guys played together? Well, any idea how many years? It's like, uh, Yeah, it's 21 years now. 21 years. So basically like sisters by now. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so, Last year was a big year for us. It was our 20th anniversary, and we didn't even really get to play very much. So. <laughs> no, you didn't get to play much. No. A little you, bit. A little is there, bit. Is there, are there any fighting going on? Is there ever the like sister fighting things? Well, when we were younger, definitely, but <laughs> not as much now. We're more mature for that, but, I mean, everyone fights. <laughs> Rachel, I want to ask you about uh, the opportunity to to go to back-to-back Olympics. Um, the, the opportunity the pressure of that, being the defending champion to try to get back to another Olympics. Your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing opportunity for us as a team um, to get back there and uh, see what we can do. We learned a lot from our last experience at trials and at the Olympics, and we're just looking to keep building and trying to be better every time we go. And so we're excited that we're in trials. We were able to qualify early with the COVID. It was a little bit scary <laughs> if we're trying to qualify. Um, but Curling Canada did a great job of, of trying to make sure that the best teams were there. And I think it'll be a great week. And um, absolutely, there's going to be pressure. There's going to be pressure on everybody. Um, and I mean, if you're in a press situation, that's a good thing because uh, th- that means you're in the big game. So we're uh, looking forward to that. I think you brought up a great point in that uh, an opportunity to get to a second one because uh, – an Olympics is such a different stage. As, as you know, it's such a different stage. And a second opportunity coming in there knowing wa- eyes wide open what you're, what you're walking into, the, uh, the chaos uh, of, of an Olympic Games. What kind of advantage do you think that would give a team like yours, being one of the best teams in the world, obviously, but a second kick at the cat when you, you know what to expect? Yeah, I think it's a huge advantage to be able to go there, experience the highs and lows and learn from both sides and um, know what works for you, what doesn't. It's tough to go in there for a first time and just hope they prepared well enough. Um, we've, we've been there, we've done it, and so we know exactly what we need to do to be at the top of the podium that week. Uh, Emma, is there something that your team has done maybe a little bit different this year in preparation in case you win the trials? Obviously, if you don't win the trials, it doesn't matter, right? But if you do... Is there something that you've done a little different so that when you walk on an Olympic stage again, maybe you're prepared, maybe a little different? Yeah, we took a close look after the last pre-Olympic prep and identified some areas that could be changed in um, how we managed our time leading in, uh, how training looked, where training was taking place. And uh, we made a new schedule based off how we felt Um, we could be better prepared going into the Olympics if we do win the trials. So we did take a close look. We analyzed everything about it and uh, made a plan that will work better for us, hopefully, if we do get that chance. Right. So I guess uh, if you could let me in a little bit inside that door, I don't give away all all the secrets, (laughs) but but, uh, because we did the same thing all those years ago and uh, to try to be prepared. Um, can you let let uh, our listeners in a little bit as to what what were the major, I guess, the major areas of of change to be prepared in the event that you do win in uh, Saskatoon? Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing was um, after winning the trials, there wasn't a lot of time before Christmas, so you're kind of uh, excited and um, you want to keep training, but also you need to take a little bit of a break, so. Uh, last time around, we did pre-Olympic training in Japan, um, and we, we spent some time there. So we had kind of a long flight to, to head over there to do some training, uh, which wasn't ended after a flight. There was also like a train ride and everything, and uh, then we had to do the same thing to head to Korea, and we felt like that was a lot of additional travel time that maybe wasn't necessary instead of training here, trying to get on the time zone here. Um, so we are just made some changes like that to try to limit the amount of commitment that we have if we do get to go back beforehand so that we can maximize rest time as well. Okay, hang on. Uh, so before the Olympics, I just want to get this, I wasn't even thinking going to ask you this. You went to Japan and for a training session and, and, and a train ride, and, and then did you come back home 
No, no, no. We just, it was, um, we stayed in Japan. It was just to get on the time zone early. So to train in Japan and then we left Japan and headed to Korea. But uh, it was just a lot of it because you can head straight to Korea and then you avoid just additional travel days. So it, it was a great idea at the time to get on the time zone early and do our training there. But uh, there was a lot of just time spent in transportation and that's kind of how it it worked out. And transportation means mayhem. A in, little in, bit, in real yeah. Life. Like, <laughs> in yeah, our situation, like, it's well, not I, easy. Yeah, I mean, it was a little chaotic, uh, but for no fault of anybody's, it just that's how it was ended up happening. So just making a couple tweaks there to just maximize rest and. Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the training because, of course, you're living in Ontario, and the rest of the team and coach Marcel Rock in Alberta. Um, how are you making that work, Rachel? Because it's a little tricky. Or maybe it's not. Yeah, I mean, Emma and I have curled together for so long. Um, and we've done, we've put in so much time and work together. Um, and it's great to have us all in the same city right now that we can train and, and work together and grow as a team because it's a new lineup, relatively. And so the more reps we can get and the more reps the front end can get sweeping my rocks and, and judging and kind of finding their groove together as a sweeping tandem. Um, It's a really great setup, and we get we travel back and forth and make sure that we train lots as a team um, and get in what we feel like we need to. Yeah, we should probably bring up the fact that you do have a new member, Sarah Wilkes, on the team, right? And uh, that is a very strong curler, though, Mm -hmm. (laughs) coming on the team. But it is a little bit different chemistry. You're right. I would like to ask you about Marcel as well, Um, his role. Like, obviously a great player when he played. But what's his role on, on, on your team? I think it's important for to have that coach and that outside voice and a different perspective and to help push us and practice and um, challenge us and, and push us in, in different directions and make sure that we didn't leave any stone unturned going into any event. And then um, with our planning process as well, going into trials and um, then hopefully moving forward towards the Olympics. I definitely wanted to go there. Maybe that's why you segued nicely there for me. And that is your the planning of how to be prepared to, to peak in November at the trials. How have you worked this uh, this year, Emma, so far as far as the amount of play, amount of events, amount of rest, but then also the, the off-ice training as well, uh, both uh, in the gym and, of course, uh, psychologically? Um, yeah, we, we tried not to play too, too much. Um, it's hard because the trials being pushed up a little bit is making it so you have less time to get those events in. So uh, we're we made enough or our schedule so that we have enough time to rest and recover, um, get our training in, but also get enough competition and real games that we can learn different stuff on the ice too. Because in a real game versus in practice, you see different things that you need to bring back to tr- your training. So and just balancing it enough of uh, workout time, rest time, practice time, but uh, it's pretty much go, go, go at this point. We're just making sure that we're physically and mentally ready. Sure. Three big rule, potential rule changes, World Curling Federation. We've been asking everybody this because it's very spread out. More than I thought it would be. I thought consensus would be a lot tighter, but it's not. I wonder Uh, why Ben was swearing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's go to you first. (laughs) Uh, No tick zone first. I honestly don't really team. know the rules. Can you explain okay, them? Because so here it's no ticks and eight and extra, but is that the same? So, yeah, no tick zone, anything on the center line. And of course, the whole game? For the whole game. And, uh, and of course, your team excelled at that for a long, long time. So, your thoughts on no tick zone uh, all through the game from start to finish? Um, I, I understand like the no tick rule, but. The problem with the no-tick zone is if you touch a centerline guard by accident, it's like you didn't even throw. So I think that changes the game a lot. And, like, sometimes there's a mistake and, like, you move it over a centimeter and you roll in and there's still, like, lots of offense opportunity and and lots of... um, lots of area for the game to be interesting. Um, but if that were to happen under those rules, the rock would come off and you'd be at such a big disadvantage. That, yeah. I don't know no how, reason. I don't know if that's like the way to go. If that's maybe you can't move it 
within the forefoot line might be a little bit of a better idea because if you crash a guard with draw weight, you're not going to move it outside the forefoot line. And and I understand like that's where they want to take the game. Fill your boots. Like we're all in to, <laughs> to play hard and, and if they want more rocks in play, that's fine. Um, but I think if you touch a guard, your rock shouldn't be ripped off. That doesn't make any sense just because you want to avoid a tick. I also think that it brings an element of um, officials being more involved where we're really lucky in our sport that we don't have a, a lot of involvement from officials. It's um, pretty self-regulated. So to if unless they have some sort of device that can measure if the rock is actually touching the center line or not, then you're just going by somebody's choice almost if it's close that day or one person's eye versus another. And I think that that is an element that hopefully we can avoid. <laughs> sure. Like even today it happened in the eighth end. Uh, we were tied up yeah. with hammer and the other team just missed the center line. And they're like, well, I think it's off. And I'm like, well, I know it's off. So like, even if like it's clear, the other team is still going to be like fight for their rock. Right. And they have all the right to do that. But it's like, how do we tell if it's on the center line or Out not? Out comes the official, right? Yeah. So to your point, Emma, you're, you're bringing out more officials. Well, and we played in the Everest event a few years ago where if you hit covered pin, you got two points. So that was like a weird rule that they made for that event. And then we actually, the team that I was on got punished because there was a rock that to us was not or was covering the pin, and then the official just came out, took a quick look, and was like, no, it's not, kicked it off. And so I, we would never want games to be decided off of um, an official. Like, we're, like I said, we're so fortunate that that's not a big factor in our game. So to go back, we feel like we're going backwards by doing that. Okay. The one that seems to be gaining a lot of interest is a four-minute Per end. Well, for the first half of the game, four minutes and 15 seconds for the second five ends of the game. <laughs> yeah. uh, Emma, sure, go ahead first. Because yeah. uh, these are these are going into the World Championships. Like, it's, 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 like They really are. <laughs> We've played, we played the World Cup in Shanghai with that role. Um, it was the first event of the season for us, so it's hard to... And we played a Canada Cup with it, but um, I feel like it makes... Um, the game kind of worse because there's more rushing. And a lot of the time they, they think that it's going to make teams not play defensively at the beginning of the game. But for a lot of teams, that's not the reason they're playing defensively in the beginning of the game. Um, at least for us, if we're not going for it at the beginning, it's not like, got a bank for time. Like there's a lot of reasons that you would blank an end or um, manage the scoreboard the way you do. So I think people are still going to play their game, but you're going to get more misses as people are rushing to make sure. Like from my perspective as a third at that event, I was like, got to throw because Rachel has to throw and I need to give her enough time to call her both shots, get back down. And I just felt personally rushed. So I don't I think that the time isn't an issue uh, the way it is now. But that's. <laughs> I'm wondering, Rachel, if you think that um, this new rule, if it if it is, uh, with the four minutes and four minutes and fifteen seconds, will it add? Because you you are the best at blanking the first, getting your deuce in second, and taking complete control of the game. It's something that you've made a ton of money on <laughs> over the years. Um, having four minute first half of the game per end, do you think it's going to cause more rocks and play the first end or two? Less or well, what are your no, thoughts on I, this? I don't think the time uh, goes into a factor of your strategy. Your strategy is not going to change. Um, everyone's perfected to make sure that that works for their skill set, for their level. Changing the time crunch is just going to, I think, force more mistakes. Like when we were in Shanghai and we played that time frame, one of my rocks, I had to sprint down to the other end. I was like, call a shot, I'm, I'm throwing it. And I had to get like, I had like 10 seconds to throw my rock. And so I don't think that we, that's where we want to push the game. Um, I think if they're looking for more, more offensive play, totally fine. But make a rule accordingly. Let's not put everybody under the gun to try and throw as many shots as they can as quickly as they can. I think that's that just uh, is going to be uh, bring our, everyone's percentage down, I think. And the big one, no extra ends. Uh, but the bigger, and I'm not even sure if that's the biggest change or uh, possible for different scenarios of, of points at the end of the game. Three points for what? a clean win, two points to win the, the uh, shootout, one point if you lose the shootout, 
So if the game ends up tied. What shootout? So if the game's up tied, there are no extra ends at the World Championship. So it's game. like hockey games. Like you get the point to take it to overtime. Yeah, if you win the uh, overtime, sure. And yeah. then if you lose you get the overtime, you the second for point for winning it Correct. in overtime. Because, uh, now, I, I don't know. I, I'd love to hear your guys' opinion on this because it's, it's quite a change to our, our, our sport. Yeah, I hate this one. This is the, <laughs> the other two. It's like, okay, like that's not a, a big deal. But you can play the whole game to manage it so that you have hammer in the extra end. Or, yeah, and all of a sudden um, – if you are one up with in the tenth, um, and you give up the one steal, the team you're playing against has been playing draws that whole end um, to steal that one point, and then they know exactly their weight for the one single draw. <laughs> Double peeling, playing hits, you don't know the draw weight as well. Um, I also th- think that that is such a drastic change to our game, and um, it's not going to be. <laughs> I, I can't see that very many people like that role. So, uh, Rachel, the uh, the idea maybe um, would be because they don't want to have any uh, tiebreakers. So then by having four possible results, maybe that lessens the odds of there being tied teams at the end of the round robin at the Worlds. Does that hold any water or not? Not, not really. No, I think, yeah, you play the whole game to be in control coming home. And... You, you shouldn't be punished for doing that. Um, the better team is in control the whole game. And, and like, they've been throwing draws. Yeah, <laughs> and, in the end yeah they the and they've been throwing draws the whole back half of the game. Um, 